Well, good morning, everyone. I am Pastor Steve, the church life pastor here at Bethel Assembly in Godrich. My hope is that you will all have a great and safe summer. Hopefully some time for some R&R physically while not disconnecting spiritually. A few days ago, my wife and I returned from spending some time with family in Comox Valley on beautiful Vancouver Island. We had a wonderful vacation. We were there for over two weeks. However, the travel was a little less than desirable. Maybe you have heard of some of the recent glitches at our airports, especially the one in Toronto Pearson Airport. We had a last, very last minute flight cancellation, delays, more delays, and then an unplanned stopover in Calgary. And finally, behind schedule landing in Toronto with no luggage to be found. I'm sure you would agree with me that life's journey can be much like that. The unexpected, the, the waiting, the uncertainty, you know, they tell us for every one mile of road, there's two miles of ditch. You may feel like you have lost more than your luggage. Maybe sometimes it feels like you are losing your way and you also feel alone. Life with its many detours, curves, and, and calamities can be downright frightful and discouraging to say the least. Well, in our verse for today, as good news, we are reminded of a promise that, that can alleviate our fears as we journey through life. In fact, we are even commanded to be strong and courageous because of this one amazing biblical truth. Let me read it to you. It's found in Joshua chapter 1 and 9, our verse for today, reading from the New Living Translation. He says, This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God he is with you wherever you go. They tell us the shortest distance between two cities is good company. And there are many benefits of traveling with a friend, another set of eyes to spot danger ahead, help with finding directions, especially for us guys that are directionally challenged, encouragement along the way, an extra set of hands to help out if needed. When we landed in Calgary, uh, we had to go to the far end. It seemed like forever. It was a long, long walk, and we had two heavy backpacks. There was a young gentleman who was traveling the same way we were, he offered to carry our load, our burdens, for us. He carried his own luggage on his back, but took both of ours and carried it most of the way. What a wonderful guy he was, a help to us. Well, you may miss your flight or lose your luggage, but according to Joshua, the Lord doesn't play hide-and-seek with his children. Jesus himself said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. It's equally comforting to know that he is with us at 40,000 feet in a in a thin steel tube traveling at over 500 miles per hour. He is with us 24-7. He is omnipresent. We're not talking about just anyone here traveling with us. Rather, a reliable, true friend. The Bible says that he sticks closer than even a brother. The best travel agent and tour guide, tour guide bar none. The song says, the old hymn, My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. I'm sure, I assure you today, that he will guide you safely home, a place where no luggage is required or allowed. Will you pray with me this morning? Lord, I thank you so much that you are with us. Your word says we cannot run from your presence. We cannot not escape your presence. That wherever we run to, you are already there. You are with us, God. I thank you, God, that you know uh, direction so well. You created this earth. You know how to lead us and to guide us. Not just physically, but you know how to guide us spiritually, safely home to that shore, to that heavenly rest. I pray that we would include you in everything we do, Lord, even through this summer, through the, through the months of summer when maybe we, we, we kick back a little more and we take a break, that we would not take a break from having you with us, including you in everything we do, and being mindful of your presence each and every day. I pray that you would help us on our journey to, to, to lend a hand, to be a help to others, that we would bless them and we would help them. We would encourage them along the way as well because sometimes the journey seems long and hard. Thank you, God, today for your faithfulness. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever. Well, today we continue our series on the Beatitudes, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is sitting on the mountainside, and he starts to share some against-the-grain statements to his disciples, those who are following him, and hanging on every word that he was speaking. He definitely gave them a lot to think about in a different way to live. It would not be easy, but it would result in being blessed. For the idea of Beatitudes, one word can't capture the full meaning that's in the Greek. The NIV uses blessed. Other translations use happy, well-off, fortunate, to be envied, even congratulations. So you get the idea. I like the word beatitudes, and for this series I sort of play around with it a bit, like the be attitudes or the attitudes that should be. Sort of helps me uh, remember the importance of a heavenly perspective on living in the here and now. Someone said a happy person is not a person in a set of circumstances, but rather a person with a set of attitudes. So the Beatitudes, what are they not? They're not a careless or carefree or frivolous or a natural approach to life. They're not a don't worry, be happy approach to life. They're not mind over matter, but spirit over mind. And it matters. What are they then? Think of a spiritual attitude. The Beatitude speaks of a happy person, not in a set of circumstances, but rather a person with a set of spiritual attitudes. I like that. So the Beatitudes are not just attitudes that should be, but spiritual attitudes that should be. Because there's a reconstruction of the heart. It's a changed life. It's a a, a spiritual mindset. So these Beatitudes, they outline the attitudes of the true disciple, the one who lives out the demands of God's kingdom, goes against the grain of of human worldly values and priorities and makes Christ evident in word and deed. These statements are best understood and applied only in relationship to Jesus. They don't happen otherwise. These are spiritual attitudes, remember, spoken by the one who created us, the author of life, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is the living word, the way, the truth, and the life. So they are important words, words to listen to, words to apply. It's like a a taste of heaven, and you will be blessed, Jesus says. 
It's what the Christians should look like because it is Christ. So Christians need a spiritual attitude check from time to time, myself included. And that's what the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount does. It makes you take a deep look on the inside of your life to see how you're doing and are you looking more like Christ. Last week we looked at Beatitude number one. Blessed or happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The message says you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. And the reminder is that we're not spiritually self-sufficient. We need God's Holy Spirit to help us to make us more like Christ. So when we're poor in spirit, we realize our need. Eugene Peterson said that self is the soul minus God. The soul minus God is so empty, it's hollow, it's selfish. And, and yet there's a God of love who wants to fill your heart with everything good and be that missing eternal peace. Today we look at Beatitude number two. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, the NIV says. The message says you're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most important or dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. There's a progress. Uh, First, we recognize that we are in need. We are poor in spirit. And then we repent of our self-sufficiency. We mourn. So I want to look at this verse and break it down. First of all, blessed are those who mourn or happy mourners. Who expects happy and sorrow to be used in the same sentence? It's not the normal combination of words. It's not the normal way people live. Blessed and mourning are completely opposite characteristics. Just think of our world. Our world is broken on every level. Personal, national, worldwide creation. And it's not getting better. Everyone will face loss of some sort, sometime, and somehow. There's grief, death, loss, hurt, pain, suffering, desperation. They're all part of our world and touches every person. Now, don't shut down on me now. Jesus is saying that there is a sorrow that is blessed, a mourning that can bring true happiness. Jesus knew our world is broken. So he offers a solution, himself. And you can't get any better than that. Remember, these are Jesus' words, words of love and comfort, words of life in the midst of loss. So blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You will be comforted. Why don't you let God do that today? Just open up your heart and your mind and let him speak words to you of life. In the midst of your circumstances, in the midst of your loss, in the midst of the questions that you might have or the struggles that you're going through or the challenges. Even the dreams that don't seem to be falling in place. Let him comfort you with his presence. So there are three areas I want to look at about mourning. The first is this. We mourn our circumstances. Just looking at life at a practical level. That no one is exempt from loss. If you live and love, you will lose something or someone. It's just a matter of time. Maybe it's failing health, a loss of a job, a broken relationship, missed opportunities because of a pandemic, shattered dreams, the death of a loved one. It's all too real, isn't it? As Christians, we grieve. We're human, but we grieve differently. And we're blessed because we have hope and receive comfort. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, We do not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. It's important. We do grieve, but differently. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. That is the comfort. That's the hope that we have in the midst of our grieving, our mourning. Life happens. Many times it's not fair. We mourn. And one thing to keep in mind uh, about blessed, happy are those who mourn is is that Jesus isn't adding insult to injury. It's not a, a word game hollow of any hope. They are words of life, his very presence. He is the good shepherd who walks with us through the valley of the shadows of death. As bad as life gets, that's why Jesus came. And he did something about it. He went to the cross to die for you and I. We're never alone in our circumstances. God is always with us to the ends of the earth. So spiritual attitudes, beatitudes, help us keep life and loss in perspective. Blessed are those who mourn. 
that there is a God who loves us, cares for us, is working in the background in ways that we cannot see or understand but know. According to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That's a great verse. And the morning that Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, verse 4, goes beyond our circumstances. It goes to the heart of our sinful nature and the consequences of living for self. And when we face that and faith it, we are blessed. We are comforted. So we mourn our circumstances. We can also mourn our sin. Probably not what first comes to mind when we think of mourning, which should be no surprise. The problem with self is sin. And God's standards are different from those of the world. The world would say, blessed are those who don't believe in sin, for they can do whatever they want without consequence. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Not everyone takes sin seriously. Don't be like the person who wrote this this letter to the government to appease his guilty conscience. It goes like this. Gentlemen, in clues you will find a check for 150 I cheated on my income tax last year and have not been able to sleep ever since. If I still have trouble sleeping, I'll send you the rest. Sincerely, a tax collector. Not everyone takes sin seriously, but we should. If we were to flip the Beatitudes, the unbeatitude for this verse would be, Wretched are those who deny the tragedy of their sinfulness, for they will be troubled. See, until we come to the dead end of our sins, we will never reach out to the Savior. We will be troubled. We will be lost. We will face that separation. There has to be something more than, I'm sorry, or I'm sorry I got caught, or I'm sorry I have to pay for the penalty and hope it goes away. Sin is self-centeredness that doesn't consider the heart of God. It, It leads to death because it does not lead to repentance. Max Lucado says, those who mourn are like sinners anonymous bound together by the truth of their introduction. Hi, I am me. I'm a sinner. We are all sinners. And blessed are those who spiritually mourn. We mourn our sin. And the word mourn used in this account is the same word used for the kind of grief associated with death. And this particular word, as opposed to other words, In the New Testament for morning, it's a deep sorrow which so controls one's intellect and emotion that it can no longer be contained internally. See, to mourn means to have a broken heart, like when something tragic happens or the death of a loved one. And many have experienced that. Grief is that process. Mourning is very real. And in the scripture, it means to have a sorrow um, over sin against God resulting in spiritual death an eternal separation from God. See, from Adam and Eve in the garden to this very present day, sin happens. We sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. And spiritual mourning is that brokenness of heart that our sins put Christ on the cross. There's a line from how deep the Father's love for us. It says, it was my sin that held him there. My sin. Your sin. Do we grieve that? Do we mourn that? Do we realize the cost of Jesus Christ dying on the cross? The reason he had to was our sin. To mourn for your sins, Max Licato says, is a natural outflow of poverty of spirit. The second beatitude should follow the first, but that's not always the case, he says. Many deny their weakness. Many know they are wrong, yet pretend they are right. And as a result, they never taste the exquisite sorrow of repentance. Of all the paths to joy, this one has to be the strangest, he says. True blessedness, Jesus says, begins with deep sadness. Blessed are those who know they are in trouble and have enough sense to admit it. When I was pastoring up north years ago and involved with an after-school program, uh, there was a volunteer, Elaine Johnson, who would share a great definition of sin that the kids could understand and relate to. It's this, sin is anything we think, say, or do that breaks God's heart and makes him sad. Simple, but true of all of us, kids and big kids alike. Sin is sin all around the world throughout time. And even Paul struggled not only with doing the things he should not, but not doing the things he should. 
And we could all relate to Paul. We have no one to blame but ourselves. I mean, God gives us the way to live. In the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments were given for a purpose, for protection and benefit. And crossing that line of temptation and breaking those commandments would ultimately lead to sickness and sin and sorrow. But following the Ten Commandments would result in spiritual health, mental health, and physical health. Those were good things, and the people needed that because of their human nature. See, sin, it's everyone's problem, not, not someone else's fault. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A man with a morning spirit couldn't, without a morning spirit, I should say, couldn't care less whether he pleases God or not. He is completely unconcerned about his sins and the defects in his character. Now, if we truly mourn sin, there's no one to blame but ourselves. Not God, not the devil, not another person, not life, nor circumstances, just ourselves. And when we mourn, when we get to the point of sorrow for our sins, when we admit that we have no other option but to cast our cares on him, Jesus, Then we mourn and we allow him to calm the storms in our life, to give us forgiveness, to make us a brand new on the inside. And he gives us that hope and strength to live for him each day. See, when we spiritually mourn, we do something about our sin by letting God do something about it. We come to him, we ask for forgiveness, we repent, and we're restored to our right relationship. So I want to look at some scriptures, how to mourn. I just want to let scriptures read, uh, speak for themselves. Psalms 51, the Psalm of David. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You are right in your verdict and justified when you judge Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness, even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way so that sinners will turn back to you. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is this, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, you, O God, will not despise. In Psalm 66, verse 16 to 20, it says, Come and hear all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my lips. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God surely has listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. In 2 Corinthians, in the New Testament, 7, verse 6 to 11, Talks about godly sorrow. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you have given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, But because your sorrow led to repentance, for you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. James 4, verse 7 to 10 gives a lot of good steps that we can do in mourning, spiritually mourning for our sin. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, 
and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. John 1 verse 9, 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us or purify us from all unrighteousness. So how is our mourning turned into joy to have this blessedness, this happiness? Number one, realize what you can do for yourself. Mourn, spiritually mourn. And then realize what God can do for you. He can give you comfort. If you take sin seriously, you will seriously mourn and know God's comfort which brings blessing and happiness. The third thing that we can mourn is the brokenness of our world. Our world is not getting better. Mankind will never create the solution to true happiness and creation groans for Christ's return. We're all waiting. Ever since the Garden of Gethsemane episode where Adam and Eve sinned, rebelled against God and decided to live on their terms instead of obeying God, the world has been broken. And the result of our sin and the sin of others, the injustices of war and hate all around the world, the natural disasters that happen, tornadoes and tsunamis, hurricanes, disease, etc., they put the world in a holding pattern. They're looking for relief. But it can only be found in God and what he offers. Jesus understands our world. Jesus mourned. In Isaiah 53, it tells us that he was a man of sorrows. And again, let me read this scripture to you. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces when he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed." We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities." Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressions. He understands us. He's a man of sorrows. He mourns. In the New Testament, when Jesus walked this earth, he mourned. Jesus isn't cold to your circumstances uh, your feelings, your loneliness. He is touched by your humanity. When Jesus, his friend Lazarus, had died, in John chapter 11, verse 13, it says Jesus was moved in spirit and troubled. And then verse 35 talks about the shortest verse in the Bible. It tells us so much about this man of sorrows. Two words, Jesus wept. And those two words speak volumes of the depth of his humanity. He wept, he cared. He loved. And he felt what Mary and Martha felt. He understood them. He stood there beside Mary and cried. Different from the other mourners who were there, there were professional mourners hired to lend support, and they would weep and wail. But Jesus' was pure emotion, straight from the heart, gushing well, spring, outflowing, overflowing, pure mourning, sadness. On another occasion, when Jesus saw the brokenness of Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, it says, he wept over it. 
When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before his death, Matthew 26 and 37 to 38, tells us that he said to Peter, James, and John, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus cares. He was moved in spirit. He was troubled. He wept. He was overwhelmed. We are in good company. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And I want to look at that last part now. They will be comforted. Imagine what life would be like if we only grieved, mourned, but never had any comfort. Never experienced the peace that passes all of our understanding and guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If we knew only of our sin and how it hurts God and others, but never received forgiveness, to live with the guilt and the shame and the regret of the past and never to live in freedom, that's no way to live or die. There's so much more. There's God's comfort. They will be comforted. Not if, not possibly, but they will be comforted. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. Jesus said, Come unto me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 to 5, says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in, in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. That's a lot of comfort going on. All comfort well, I'm glad I know Jesus Christ because we all face life and we all have struggles and we all sin. And the difference is the end result. It's what we do when we are mourning and grieving. Our struggles lead us to a path of coming to God, a, a place of complete rest and trust and safety in Him. And even when we mourn because we're poor in spirit, we will be comforted because we go to God. We allow Him to do a work in our lives. And when we mourn our spiritual condition, our sins, and repent, we receive God's comfort and forgiveness and strength and encouragement to persevere in the race, to not give up. Let's keep going. You can do that. When we become mourners like Jesus wants us to be and receive his comfort of sins forgiven, hope to carry on, he changes us. He gives us reason to keep going on. People see Christ in us. Yes, it's against the grain living, but we're alive fully. We're spiritually living the way he wants us to be, and that brings blessing. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. True mourning leads to true comfort and to an unspeakable peace and joy. You could pray this prayer. God, thank you for the cross for forgiveness, for restoration to a right relationship with you. Help us to spiritually mourn when we have sinned and resolve to live for you. Strengthen us by your spirit, we pray. Thank you for the comfort that you give and the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen.